Hello and welcome to the monthly Central U.S. Climate Outlook. My name is John Eyes with the National Weather Service Central Region Headquarters in Kansas City. I will be today's moderator. Before we begin our introduction, uh, I have muted everyone's line so everyone may enjoy the full benefit of the call. Thank you. Our speaker today is Pat Ganan of uh, the University of Missouri. He is uh, the Extension and State Climatologist uh, there. And uh, following the briefing, uh, he, we will open up the lines to take questions. Now let's turn it over to Pat. Pat? Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I, on my first image, I have actually a couple of photos um, taken from Northeast Missouri recently. And I think we it's safe to say this could be a multi-state theme. Some very wet conditions exist across the north central region. And we are starting to see some impacts in regard to the crops that are feeling a lot of wetness, saturated soybeans and some nutrient issues with uh, nitrogen leaching and creating some yellow corn up in Marion County in northeast Missouri. Some quick um, housekeeping information. The, um, Providing the climate services to the central region is a collaborative activity between various folks associated with NOAA, the American Association of State Climatologists, Regional Climate Centers, NOAA CPC, and the National Drought Mitigation Center. The next uh, Drought Outlook webinar will take place on uh, July 16th. Brian Fuchs from the National Drought Mitigation Center will be the host. Uh, for future climate webinars and information, the link below there, and past recorded presentations and slides can be found at the um, MRCC and the HPRCC online. Uh, the agenda, I may recap of what we've experienced weather-wise here in the North Central region, current conditions, some of the impacts across the area, climate outlooks, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions and comments. This is the statewide ranking of um, May temperatures across the United States. It was uh, overall, when you crunch the numbers, it ranked about six tenths of a degree Fahrenheit above the 20th century average and made it the 47th warmest May on record. The blues are indicative of below average temperatures as you go east. Uh, warmer conditions across um, eastern United States, especially in the northeast, where we saw some top five, top ten, even wet or warmest Mays on record in parts of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Uh, the cooler conditions uh, in the Central Plains and part of the Rockies, I think uh, what added to that was the significant rainfall that occurred and snowfall across the area that uh, the cloudy conditions over an extended period of time suppressed maximum temperatures and led to a, a slightly cooler condition for the month of May. Precipitation-wise, a lot of green on the map, and it was a very wet May for the most part across much of the country, especially the uh, central United States. The darker greens are wettest Mays on records, and that's out of 120 years, 121 years. Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas had their wettest May on record. Several top 10 wettest, top five wettest across the middle part of the country. Uh, drier conditions as you went east, even some top uh, five, top 10 driest months uh, that went with the warm weather during May across the, the East Coast. Uh, this I consider a very uh, incredible statistic considering we have 121 years of record. It was the wettest May on record for the country. Uh, in fact, the state, the national average precip was just about four and a third inches, a little bit about almost an inch and a half above normal. And what's so impressive is that not only was it the wettest May on record any month, it was the wettest of any month on record. And so out of 1,445 months, May 2015 goes on top. Indeed, an incredible month when it comes to wetness and the magnitude of the wetness we saw last month. As, we go, as we've gone through just over half of the first half of June, on the left you'll see average temperatures across the north central region. Um, temperatures have been averaging um, above normal. Uh, on the left, I should say, those are the average temperatures. So anywhere from the 60s to middle 70s, low 80s for the average temperature on the right are the departure from normals. And so those various shades of orange on the right indicate warmer than normal conditions. 
And I think, again, with all the wetness we saw in the north central region, we saw extended periods of cloudiness. I think this warmth has been on the minimum temperature side than, say, on the maximum temperature. Um, those cloudy conditions or extended period of cloudy conditions so far this month have suppressed maximum temperatures but have kept the minimum temperatures up. And so that's why we are seeing overall a, a, a fairly warm first half of June across much of the north central region cooler conditions across the upper Midwest, in fact, below normal in the UP of Michigan and the northern part of lower Michigan. Precipitation for the month of June, it looks like the trend continues after uh, what for the north central region was actually the set second wettest on record for the north central states. Uh, this wet pattern overall is continuing. On the left, you will see estimates of, of June precipitation from June 1 through June 17. Anything in the blue shades is three or more inches of precipitation has already um, been, has fallen across a good portion of the Nebraska, Kansas, on eastward into Iowa, Missouri, covering much of Illinois and Indiana into Ohio. In fact, much higher numbers, five, six, seven inches, or even up to eight inches of rain, a pocket of over eight inches in southeastern Nebraska. When you look on the right, the departure from normal, so you see more green than you do the yellows or oranges. And so the north central region overall is, are seeing wetter conditions. I think what's interesting to note is we have a little less than a couple weeks left in the month of June, and considering what's forecasted over the next seven days and then the forecast out to two weeks, it looks like those yellow and orange shades might be filling in to a, a more greener shade uh, because some significant rainfall is anticipated over the next couple weeks. And considering that what happened in May and what we're going to see in June is highly likely an above normal precipitation month, the next image I, I thought I would put together just to provide a perspective when you combine the months of May and June. And so this is an image uh, using the north central states, the upper um, Part, uh, nor, upper part of the screen shows the, the states that were used to, to calculate these numbers. These are the May-June averages from uh, 1895 up through 2014. And in the upper left, the box indicates that the May 2015 average for the north central region was about five and a quarter inches. And so essentially all we need to make the nine inch mark for June is about three and three quarter inches. And I think that's highly likely that we will see that and reach this nine inch mark. And if that's the case, the May June period for the North Central region will rank right in the top five, perhaps wet, as wet or wetter than what we saw in 2010, 1995, and then 1957, 1915, and 1908 also round up the top five up through 2014. So something to keep an eye on considering uh, some very wet conditions that have continued into the middle part of June. And it looks like with forecast that will continue over the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, accordingly, the rivers and streams across the middle part of the country have uh, responded to all this wetness, especially in May and, and, and as we go into the month of June. This is a snapshot of, from USGS of the current stream flow across the country. Any of the blues and blacks are indicative of the darker blue is a much above normal uh, stream flow conditions. The black dot indicates it's the estimated stream flow that ranks as the highest value ever measured for the day of the year. And we see uh, quite a few records broken in Texas and uh, northern Illinois, portions of the northern half of Indiana, lower Michigan, parts of northwest Ohio, some areas in um, Missouri, parts of Colorado, and southwestern South Dakota experienced their highest June 18th stream flow of record. When we look at some the mountain snowpack water content on a couple basins, uh, the north, total North Platte Basin, which is located in southeastern Wyoming, uh, snowfall conditions uh, were not uh, were a little bit lackluster this past winter, and so the response has been below normal. The numbers have peaked on March 28th which was 72% of normal peak. A little bit more snow fell in northeastern Colorado this past winter that led to better conditions. When we look at the, the snowpack water content, it actually peaked. And we had some very uh, wet conditions in May as well, and that helped bring up that uh, on May, it peaked on May 24th and was actually above normal of normal peak. But all in all, the mountain snowpack is pretty much uh, gone. When you look at the end of the chart, you'll see uh, there's not much left in the, in the South Platte Basin. 
These are the Missouri River Basin conditions, and it's, I'd like to focus on ongoing. This is a snapshot of river observations from today, uh, river and stream flow conditions. You'll see the yellows and the oranges and the reds as you go from uh, southeastern Wyoming, northeast Colorado, through Nebraska, and to Kansas, and on down into Missouri, all the way to St. Louis. Uh, in southeast Wyoming, in where the North Platte exists, we see some um, near flood stage conditions. And, and also in northeastern Colorado, near flood stage, as you go eastward into the North Platte and River and the Platte River in Nebraska, we see more minor flooding conditions. And as we work our way southeastward into Nebraska, northeast Kansas, and along the Missouri River, we also see some more. Uh, oranges and reds, which are indicative of some minor to moderate flooding conditions. Um, so indeed, flooding continues along the South Platte, North Platte, Platte Grand, and the Grand River in northwest Missouri, as well as the, the Missouri River. Moving eastward into the north central uh, Mississippi River Basin, again, uh, focus on the, the yellows and the reds and the oranges. Uh, the Mississippi River from pretty much uh, eastern Iowa south to uh, just north of Cape Girardeau, we are indicating some minor flooding conditions ongoing. There have been some big rains recently over the past seven to ten days over parts of southern Iowa, uh, eastern Iowa, and on into northern central Illinois, as well as northern Indiana, parts of southern Michigan, and these rivers and streams have responded accordingly. As we go eastward into Illinois, the Illinois River, uh, many, area, many parts of the Illinois are witnessing moderate flood conditions. Uh, eastward into northeast um, Illinois, the Kankakee River, the Wabash River, parts of Indiana are seeing some flooding conditions in that region as well. Of course, we have a tropical system that's spinning currently over Oklahoma, and there is the forecast, as you will see later, is indicating some significant, substantial stripe of rainfall going into Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, uh, a good portion of the Ohio River Basin. And there is the anticipation that these moderate uh, minor flood conditions we're seeing right here, right now, could perhaps go into major flooding especially on portions of the Illinois, Merrimack, and Mississippi rivers over the next several days. So something definitely to keep an eye on as uh, tr remnants of Tropical Storm Bill move over the region. Looking at the Ohio River Basin, I mentioned earlier some of the rivers uh, with these recent rain events across northern and central Indiana. They've responded uh, and gone at or above flood stage. Again, uh, uh, some flooding continues along the St. Mary's, the Wabash, and the Tippecanoe Rivers. And, uh, and also, as, uh, as the remnants of Bill moves into the Ohio River Basin, there could be some response as well with some, some of the forecasted rainfall. The, the map on the left shows just what's been an amazing recovery with all the rain we've seen in May in regard to drought conditions across the, the north central area. In fact, on the left you could see all the way from Minnesota down to Texas there were some significant swaths of abnormally dry to severe drought conditions. And then fast forward less than a month later and it looks like someone took their eraser out and <laughs> took away quite a bit of those uh, antecedent dry conditions. In fact, uh, some significant recovery with with all this rain we've seen during the latter part of May and on into June. Right now, it's pretty much relegated to just a few pockets of abnormal dryness. Um, some moderate droughts still long-term, I should say, not short-term, long-term drought conditions in parts of southeast South Dakota, northeast Nebraska, northwest Kansas. Um, and also, I don't want to forget uh, what's going on in southern Indiana and parts of north central and eastern Kentucky. Actually, we see some emerging or evolving drought, drier conditions. Uh, they've, that part of the region has been more under the influence of an upper air high that's in the southeastern U.S., and so rain events have been fewer and not as heavy across the eastern region of the north central part of the states. I know there's a lot here, but uh, a lot of impacts, of course, when you have a, a very, one of the wettest Mays on record followed by a continuation of, of wet conditions in uh, the first half of June. I'm going to start in the upper left and work my way clockwise just to talk about a little bit about the impacts we've seen in the north central region. Uh, prior to all these rains, actually, there were some uh, there was some very cold weather in the winter. We had some 
agricultural impacts on the winter wheat, as well as sugar beets and canola damage due to a late May freeze. But also I want to mention there was some winter wheat that saw some stress because some very dry conditions, no snowpack in the Dakotas uh, that has led to some freeze injury and impacted the winter wheat condition um, as well. And just to the right of that, it was a very dry January through April to wet, and that has transitioned incredibly to a very wet May. And so as the earlier map shown on the drought monitor, it showed some major drought status reduction has taken place in North and South Dakota as well as Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin as well. In Michigan, there were some, again, very cold February temperatures can, and then a, a, a late May freeze that led to some fruit crop damage uh, to grapes, blueberries, cherries, and peaches, and apple damage in northwestern lower Michigan. Unfortunately, some areas, uh, that's two years in a row. They had a very cold winter last year that led to some, some fruit crop injuries so for two consecutive years in parts of, 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 of Michigan. The drier conditions uh, in Michigan and Indiana also helped winter wheat. Um, some wet conditions that emerged in May actually created more opportunity in parts of Kansas for uh, diseases uh, and the wheat became vulnerable to, but drier conditions, warmer conditions in Michigan and Indiana actually led to, uh, according to the National Ag Statistics Service, nearly 70% of the winter wheat is considered to be in good and excellent condition in Michigan and Indiana. I had mentioned earlier about the emerging dryness that's taken place in southern Indiana and northern and eastern Kentucky. I think that could be fairly ephemeral considering what is forecast with the remnants of Tropical Storm Bill, it could actually put an, uh, a quick end uh, with what they're forecasting for rainfall over the next few days. As we work our way downward into Missouri and parts of Kansas, uh, a big impact of this wetness has been delayed soybean planting. I think Murray, um, Missouri is furthest behind in soybean planting. I think believe only 42% of the soybean crop has been planted. We have more than 3 million acres yet to be planted in Missouri, and unfortunately these existing wet conditions do not help at all. Uh, similarly, some wet conditions in Kansas has led to some delayed soybean planting. Uh, significant drought status reduction with these wet conditions in May uh, and continuing into June have eliminated, been eliminated pretty much across much of Colorado and Kansas. Also, below normal snow, below normal snow season overall in Colorado uh, with the wet conditions that came about in May and have continued into June, the rivers have rebounded very well. Uh, some records include, some new flood records include uh, the Powder River in Wyoming, the Cheyenne River in South Dakota, Salt Creek in Nebraska, and the Little Blue River in Kansas. It's interesting to note that earlier on, prior to all this wetness, uh, there was concern about a navigation season uh, being a full one for for this year across the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, especially along Missouri where we and Mississippi, where we saw uh, antecedent and dry conditions. But of course, that is uh, on the flip side. Uh, perhaps uh, if this wetness continues into the summer, I think more of a concern will be too much high river levels that could impact a, the navigation season. Uh, let's look specifically at some of the crop condition reports according to the National Ag Statistics Service that was issued on June 14th. Uh, winter wheat condition, I touched a little bit on that. I've highlighted some of the concerns or the uh, worst conditions perhaps of almost a third of the winter wheat crop, crop in Kansas, a very poor to poor condition. I think uh, uh, perhaps some cold conditions earlier in the year, little snowpack, and then followed by some very wet conditions as of late has, have led to the, the worst conditions. And that also extends into Nebraska and South Dakota, especially with the impacts of the cold, dry winter that they saw uh, earlier that led to worse conditions. And I had mentioned Indiana and uh, Michigan was where we see the, the best conditions on winter wheat. When we go below the, that, we look at the corn condition. Overall, uh, it's interesting to note that corn crop is looking pretty good across the north central region. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see with these uh, big rain events, uh, ongoing rain that's forecasted over the next couple of weeks, how these numbers respond. Obviously, it's not good in some areas, Missouri, for example, uh, with some nutrient deficiencies due to nitrogen leaching out and uh, a lot of uh, flooded corn and, and yellow corn issues. And so something to keep an eye on if this wet trend continues over the next few weeks. 
Soybean condition in the upper right uh, shows some, uh, some of the concerning issues in regard to Kansas and Missouri where we've seen some of the wetter conditions. Uh, generally almost half or more than half of, of the soybean is, is reported in anywhere from very poor to fair condition. Better conditions in parts of the Corn Belt and as you go east, uh, the rest of the states actually more than 50 percent of our indicating soybeans in good to excellent condition. And on the bottom right, you'll see just uh, that there are two states still running well behind in their soybean planting because of the wetness. Uh, Missouri, in fact, only 42 percent as of June 14th. Uh, we're running 37 percentage points behind average when it comes to the five-year uh, average of how much soybean is planted. So uh, some big concerns in that regard because conditions are still saturated across Missouri in parts of Kansas. Uh, some additional impacts due to this wet weather across the region. There's been some a lot of opportunities for plant diseases, especially with uh, numerous days we've had precipitation, we've had extended periods of cloudiness, and so vegetation is starting to, to see these impacts due to the extended wet period on trees, fruit crops, row crops, forages, and turf. Uh, nutrient deficiencies I mentioned earlier, especially with nitrogen. Oh, you know, on the, but there are winners in regard to this. It's been a very robust uh, year for lawn care business. The grasses are going like crazy, and uh, but additionally, you know, outdoor recreation uh, outdoor recreation activities have been compromised as well. And, uh, the, ever since Memorial Day, when pools, outdoor pools were opening, uh, there's. Uh, hasn't been a lot going on. The same for golf courses. There hasn't been much activity because of these extended cloudy, rainy periods. Uh, uh, perhaps another good aspect in regard to uh, forage crops across the middle part of the country and across much of the country. These are the as of June seventh, the percent of pasture and rangeland in good or very condition. Uh, Sixty-three percent of the country, uh, uh, on average, are, are seeing good, very good conditions of pasture. So, no issues, uh, at least in, in many of the states, when it comes to uh, shortages on, on pastures and rangelands. And uh, things are looking pretty good with all the green on the map. Topsoil moisture as well. If anything, it's it's adequate. Uh, to and these are the extent of the percentages of topsoil moisture that are considered short or very short. See some very low numbers across much of the middle part of the country. Zero percent here in Missouri, where uh, we are saturated. Drier conditions, of course, across the Pacific Northwest into um, California, Nevada, parts of Montana and New Mexico. But overall, uh, moisture conditions in the topsoils are are pretty. Pretty, pretty wet across uh, much of the country. Let's look a little bit at some of the climate outlooks. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about the, the seven-day precipitation forecast, which is rather foreboding. This, uh, I, sh I, I just put in the 8 to 14-day outlook, so I took out the 6 to 10. I'll show the 8 to 14-day outlook. Forecast for July, which just was issued this morning, as well as the July, August, September outlook, and a winter outlook, all which came out this morning from the Climate Prediction Center. This is a forecast over the next seven days, and um, there is uh, quite a stripe of, of purples and oranges uh, extending from northeast Oklahoma into southern third of Missouri, northern Arkansas, over into Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, on Kentucky. These are anywhere from two to as much as six inches of rainfall, all complements of what's going on in Texas and Oklahoma with uh, with the remnants of, of, of Tropical Storm Bill, expected to slowly nudge eastward and northeastward, dropping the heaviest amount of rain. That's a lot of water, and, and, and it's evident that this could be this would be a concerning forecast considering the antecedent conditions, especially across parts of Illinois and Missouri. And uh, also some systems across the northern plains, upper Midwest, are, in, are expected to uh, occur all the way into early next week, and that's a fairly healthy dose of precip, anywhere from one to almost uh, three, even pockets of over four inches in north central Iowa. Obviously, all three basins that will be impacted, uh, all three major river basins will be impacted uh, if the, this forecast verifies. With that forecast, uh, this is the significant river flood outlook, and um, the, the areas shaded in yellow indicate the possibility of some significant river flooding to occur, and you can see that pretty much follows uh, pretty well the track of where uh, remnants of Tropical Storm Bill will be going. There are drier conditions across southern Indiana and northern Kentucky, so that might hold off initially some uh, flood response, but overall, uh, it looks like uh, 
the possibility of some significant flooding across uh, the red and the the Red River Basin, the Arkansas River Basin, on into the uh, Mississippi and Ohio and portions of the Ohio River Basin. Already, we see significant flooding across Northwest Ohio, Northern Indiana, along the Illinois River, and on into portions of Missouri, and then a few pockets in Southeast Wyoming, and um, are possible for flooding across the Platte. The 18, eight, the 8 to 14 day forecast, uh, which would cover the period June 25th through July 1. Uh, on the left, this is the temperature outlook, and it, in, it, it looks like it uh, high confidence and in, in, across the southeast to have warm weather to continue. Uh, perhaps uh, an expansion of the ridge that currently resides over the southeastern U.S. will bring some. Uh, hotter conditions across a good portion of the southeast, extending all the way into central Oklahoma. A little corridor below normal temperatures are anticipated, and then the warmth returns across much of the uh, western part of the country as well as Alaska. On the east, what looks somewhat distressing is a, lot, a stripe of green that is uh, forecast to extend all the way from Arizona to Maine, and uh, that's above normal precipitation, a fairly high confidence interval that encompasses southern Iowa and on into a good portion of Missouri, almost all of Iowa, all of Kansas, Indiana, and Ohio. So uh, it looks like this wet pattern that we're seeing in, in a good portion of the, at least the, the, the middle part of the north central, east part of the north central region will continue, maybe perhaps drier conditions across the Pacific Northwest extending eastward into western Minnesota. El Nino is here to stay. Uh, some of the outlooks that have been recently issued are indicating uh, we are in a moderate El Nino condition, and there is strong um, a strong probability, a 90% chance of El Nino continuing through the end of 2015. I believe it was, yeah, an 85% chance that it will uh, continue into early next year. So. Uh, the map below shows the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly in the equatorial Pacific. You can see those very warm con conditions running uh, more than 3 degrees C above normal across the coast of Peru, extending westward to a pretty good contour of 2 degrees warmer uh, anomaly across uh, parts uh, of the, the equatorial Pacific. Uh, the other condition is there's been some good coupling going on with this, this current uh, El Nino event. Uh, there are in indications of the outgoing long wave radiation. does indicate some significant convection going on along this area and uh, some drier conditions in Indo Indonesia or more sunny conditions. And so uh, a, a moderate El Nino ongoing, and it looks like it, there is high confidence it will continue into at least early next year. This sort of backs up that argument and in regard to a, a El Nino continuing into early next year on the left. Right, at, uh, this is using El Nino region 3.4. Uh, currently, we stand about one degree um, Celsius above normal. That's the criteria for a moderate El Nino event. When you get to 1.5 or higher, <clears throat> that constitutes a strong El Nino event. And the mo this is the model ensemble, or all the models of what they're forecasting on. And that that yellow line, that thick yellow line, is the are the dynamical models. Uh, fairly robust when you look at that line, and it's uh, pretty confident in indicating perhaps a strengthening or strong El Nino by the October, November, December period. Uh, the statistical averages, which is that lighter green average, also shows somewhat of a similar trend. Not as strong when it, you look at the anomalies, but nonetheless an El Nino that will continue at least through, or through early next year, as well as the uh, consolidation of models used by CPC, the light brownish line, uh, again, somewhat of a trend showing a maximum right around the November, December, January time frame of over one and a half degrees above normal. So uh, that's why we see those high probabilities of this El Nino, moderate to strong El Nino event to persist through the summer, fall, and on into early next year. This is the new July temperature and precipitation outlook that was uh, just came out this morning. It really the, it kind of subtle in the changes uh, when we look at the, the earlier outlook, but um, uh, below normal, an enhanced area of below normal temperatures is forecast in much, much of the central part of the country. There has been some good uh, 
consistency when we when the CPC looks at their dynamical models, as well as the soil moisture condition. That's considered that's taken into consideration, and we have some very wet conditions, and that sort of is built into the memory that will translate into July. And accordingly, they have a fairly high confidence of these below normal temperatures, especially across Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, North Texas, Northeast New Mexico, and the western two thirds of Colorado. Warmer than normal across the southeast, uh, and as well as the parts of western uh, U.S. and on into Alaska. On the right are the precipitation prob probabilities. There is an enhanced likelihood of above normal precipitation uh, forecast for much, again, much of the central part of the country. Uh, the, I believe that was an introduction of some drier conditions across the southeastern U.S., the southern tip of Texas. Um, but a, a fairly strong, a robust, uh, likely a higher likelihood of some wet conditions across southeast uh, Wyoming, uh, north parts of northern Colorado, and there is a El Nino signals are somewhat weak on imp um, what happens for the summer season. They're a little bit more um, robust for winter forecasts, but there are some indicators or some researchers have seen that uh, El Ninos during the summer can have some um, some put some pretty good signals and some wetter conditions across the part of the Colorado and on into Wyoming. The three month outlook for July, August, and September on the left. It looks like these uh, cool conditions or anticipation or enhanced likelihood of below normal temperatures will continue on into the rest of the summer. Uh, on the on the east coast, a slight enhancement towards above normal temperatures, higher confidence than when you look on the west coast, especially in the Pacific Northwest and on the Alaskan coast, uh, and a fairly and a pretty good 40% or more probability of below normal temps in right in the central plains or in parts of North Texas. On the right, you'll see the above no, uh, precipitation forecast for July, August, August and September. Uh, again, above normal precip across a good portion of the central part of the country on into this, uh, most of the Rocky Mountain states and drier, uh, an enhanced likelihood of drier than normal conditions across the southeast from the mid-Atlantic states on into uh, the, the uh, Texas coastline. The seasonal drought outlook, which just came out today, also indicates um, some better conditions. There were a few residual pockets or long-term pockets of dryness across the Great Plains, and uh, they're highlighted here on this map where uh, drought removal is likely, according to this outlook that goes through September 30th. Unfortunately, uh, there is persistence or intensification across much of the western U.S., where we already have an, an extreme to exceptional drought occurring in much of California, and perhaps some drop development over parts of North and South Carolina as well. But overall, in the North Central region, if this verifies, essentially drought will be non-existent across the region. The winter outlook, I had mentioned earlier how there's, uh, I believe it was an 85% uh, confidence or probability that El Nino will be around for the winter. Um, and this is a, a classic signature of a, a wintertime scenario when it comes to temperature and precipitation outlooks during El Nino events. And uh, we see above normal temperatures across Alaska, across the, the Pacific Northwest, and down into Northern California, and that extend eastward across the uh, Northern Rockies, Northern Plains, and on into the upper Midwest. A little bit of uncertainty as you go south, uh, equal chances f extend from uh, Southern California through the Mid-Rockies, on into Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, on eastward through Ohio, up into Maine, and then we start to transition towards a, an enhanced likelihood of above norm, or below normal temperatures across the southern U.S., extending from uh, New Mexico to uh, Virginia and southward to Florida and Texas, with the highest likelihood of cooler than normal conditions across southeast New Mexico and uh, southern Texas, southwest Texas. On the right, you'll, you can see. Uh, the precipitation forecast, again, classic telecommunication signal that comes from an El Nino event below normal precip in the upper Midwest portions of the Ohio River Valley, uh, as well as the uh, northern Rockies extends a little bit into the Washington, uh, northwest Alaska. Wetter than normal conditions across the Alaska coastline, as well as translating eastward from Southern California all through the Southern Plains and along the Gulf Coast and on northward into the mid-Atlantic states. 
A quick summary of some of the recent conditions we're seeing across the north central region. We do have wet conditions that continue to cover much of the north central region with the exception of southern Indiana and northern and eastern Kentucky where dry conditions have emerged lately. There are a few small pockets of long-term dryness that remain in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, and Colorado. Drought conditions have improved extensively across Colorado, the northern and central plains, and the upper Midwest. That started in May and it has continued into the first few weeks of June. The upper Missouri River Basin has gone from dry conditions in March and April to very wet in May and June, and even wetter in the lower Missouri River Basin. This dramatic change, has, change translates from a water conservation mode that existed earlier in the spring to now what we see as a flood control, perhaps slash evacuation status, all within a six weeks period. Amazing um, transition from one extreme to another. The flood potential has increased with continued June wetness from Wyoming to Indiana. More immediate flood concerns reside, reside over parts of the central Mississippi River Basin and the Ohio River Basin where tropical storm bell remnants are forecast to drop anywhere from two to six inches of rain over the region in the next few days. And some quick bullets on, on the outlooks and some comments in that regard. There is a 90% chance of El Nino continuing through the end of 2015. Small areas of dryness that currently exist in the north central region are expected to disappear as summer progresses. For July through September, there is an enhanced likelihood of below normal temperatures that are anticipated from Colorado to Illinois and Nebraska and to Texas. For July, August, and through, through September, an enhanced likelihood of above normal precipitation is anticipated from eastern Nevada to western Illinois and from South Dakota to north te Texas. Even though summer El Nino teleconnect teleconnections are weak for the U.S., some researchers have found a higher likelihood of flooding exists from Colorado as well as, in as increased odds for above normal precipitation in Wyoming and, Mon and Montana. The May through June period in the central region could very well rank in the top five wettest on record, rivaling 1993, 1995, and 2010. It is notable that the summers of 1993, 1995, and 2010 were very uncomfortable summers with high dew points over much of the central region. Late planning concerns associated with enough uh, growing degree accumulations for summer exist. Also, a researcher here at the University of Missouri, Dr. Bill Wiebold, is an agronomist. His research shows that there is at least a 25% yield reduction in soybeans that are planted during the third week of June versus planting during the early, early May here in mid-Missouri. And so uh, already with wet conditions and us getting into the third week of May and, all, and nearly 3 million acres of land has not been planted in soybean, that is uh, very concerning uh, here in Missouri. Extended wet, humid, cloudy periods leave uh, vegetation ripe for disease and proper nutrient manage, management challenging. That's an ongoing condition right now. Current high water conditions in the major basins will need to be monitored very closely as, as the summer progresses. In other, words, um, in other words, the stage is set. Uh, a little bit further information uh, in regard to today's and other uh, past recorded presentations. Again, they can be found on the Midwestern Regional Climate Center's website as well as the High Plains Regional Climate Center uh, website and some other information in regard to monthly climate reports, uh, web addresses to the Climate Prediction Center, current weather forecasts, the Climate Portal, the Drought Portal, the National Drought Mitigation Center, the American Association of State Climatologists, as, as well as regional climate centers. And uh, John, that pretty much wraps up my discussion. I'd be happy to open the floor to uh, any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, we will now open up the question and answer period. Uh, please use star six to unmute your line before asking your question. And then when you are finished speaking, please use star six to mute your line again. Our panelists today with Pat are Dennis Toddy from South Dakota State University, Doug Cluck with uh, NOAA, Jim Angel from the University of Illinois at the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, Kevin Lau from the Missouri Basin RFC of the River Forecast Center of the National Weather Service, and Kevin uh, Stamm from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, let's go ahead to the questions. Uh, we do have a few questions, so just star six uh, that you already wrote in. And I think I saw, uh, Keith, you had a, uh, a question. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, but uh, I think he doesn't have any audio 
But he did mention in his question, he says, lots of Iowa corn yellow like Missouri and side dress with north done as well. Various heights up to 20 inches and down. How much time before we uh, for cannot add north effectively if needed? So maybe you can uh, take a, a shot at that. I think it's just the condition of corn in Iowa overall. Well, right. The condition of corn in Iowa was actually was doing a little bit better than than uh, Missouri. I know that. And uh, was the question on how much nitrogen to apply? Was I will have to send that to you. Okay. <laughs> And I'll have you go ahead and answer him directly. But there have been there have been some re recently the, the the wetness has extended on and up to Iowa, especially eastern and southern parts of the state over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I know May was a little bit more uh, friendly when it comes to planting across Iowa and on into Illinois. We had those wet conditions that extended in uh, from. Oklahoma and Texas on into Kansas and Missouri, especially western parts of the state where we saw more than 10 inches in May. And unfortunately, what we saw in May was we saw frequent periods of rain events. And some of them weren't necessarily heavy, but we had a half inch there, four, ten four tenths of an inch there, all within a few days apart. And producers just didn't have that opportunity. I mean, they can plant a lot in a, a couple days, but unfortunately, we just didn't have those windows especially across northwestern Missouri, where there are actually quite a few fields that are still fallow because they were unable to get their corn in as well. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, go ahead. If anybody has a question, just use uh, star six on your phone to unmute your line. I have a question. Hello? Uh, yes, and your name and organization, please. Oh. Um, my name is Benjamin Diamond. I'm with um, the Tower Reinsurance Company, and uh, my question is about: um, Are there any other late planting concerns uh, besides for those for soybeans? I think it, what we need to keep an eye on, especially as we go north into the region, are always the – if these cool conditions continue, then we have to monitor the uh, growing degree days accordingly because there's always that potential come fall for an early fall freeze. And if we don't – and if uh, enough GDDs are not accumulated, that could lead to some impact on corn. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is Jerome Scott. I'm the district forester of the Chicago Park District, and one of the reasons I signed up for the webinar was to ask this question. I'm having a hard time finding a reference for when uh, what would define a drought condition in an urban setting for trees. I realize it's a little bit off topic, but if anybody could point me to a good publication or a good uh, resource. Um, we do not have – our system right now is when it doesn't rain enough and we stop mowing, we start watering trees. And I don't really like that system. Any suggestions? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I think um, perhaps there are, we, there are some linkages that we could link you with uh, um, the National Forest Service type folks that might have answers to that, or there may be some uh, various arboretum folks. Um, that we have connections to. So um, uh, write an email to John Ice uh, or, or whomever um, you see on your email there uh, that you got signed up for, and, uh, and we'll, we'll find, try to find an answer for you. I, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you could come on today. Uh, we just had a question that was uh, from Mike Shambaugh Miller, and are there any early predictions for production in Nebraska and Kansas? Not that I'm aware of. Dennis, would you, had you heard anything? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure can. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, certainly for soybeans in Kansas and Missouri, there's going to be reduced soybean projections. Uh, I know USDA probably hasn't come out with anything yet because we're still planting. Uh, and in Nebraska, there is starting a, a concern on 
uh, corn, be, not because it was planted too late, but because we've been wet, had cloudy conditions, and not accumulated enough heat. We, we're still early enough in the season that we can't give any assessments. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple trade-offs. The cool and wet conditions help to offset some of the potential stress you can get in, can or in uh, Kansas and Nebraska during the middle of summer. That's a good thing, but if it slows down development too much and we get too late into the season with development, with delayed development, then we lose some of that. I'm not terribly concerned overall. I think this is going to be largely beneficial, but we'll know more in you know, three to four weeks after we've gotten through July to see if, if we have corn that's, that's accumulating well enough. But from a, from a number standpoint, no, I don't think there's any numbers projected by anybody. Just... Mm. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And any other questions? Um, also, if you have any questions about uh, river conditions or uh, water, we've talked a lot about water, but uh, the other impacts from a hydrology point of view. Oh, um, one more question. Sure, go ahead. I mean again. Sure. Um, could you attribute the flooding that's taken place in um, Texas and Oklahoma and a lot of the increased wetness to to um, El Nino conditions this summer? Uh, I'm going to jump in on this just to make sure that um, the, the at least the NOAA party line sort of gets. Uh, said here, it, there have been some, uh, there has been a few things written about this, but no formal attribution study has been done. So uh, that usually takes some time to sort of better understand that. I, I do expect that someone will do that in the upcoming months, but there, ha there are some indications that there was a subtropical connection that uh, went back to the equ equator, and the Climate Prediction Center pointed this out when they... Uh, uh, which is part of the Weather Service, which released, uh, when they released their latest, I think it was last week, they re released sort of their El Nino update. And they did uh, mention the fact that there was a tropical connection to some of the moisture that fed uh, some of that flooding, at least in Texas, um, probably in, in, uh, probably in uh, Oklahoma to some degree as well. And Doug, I'll add that it's interesting, you know, seasonally, it is what's expected for the winter forecast, above normal precip across Texas and on into Oklahoma. So, Yeah, what makes this a little bit unusual is the timing of this El Nino this year. It, it uh, sort of uh, strengthened at a, a little bit of an odd time, and um, we're not sure when it's going to peak, but it does look, uh, according to the models, I, I, if you back up and show that real quick, I think it peaks uh, a little earlier than a, a stereotypical El Nino would peak. And, and those generally peak sometime in the winter, and that's when we also have the strongest um, uh, uh, what, what, correlation with, um, with temperatures and precipitation um, across the United States. I think the, the the winter outlooks, I think those are uh, saying when it exactly will peak is probably a little bit beyond the skill of the models to say exactly when that's going to happen. But we, we should watch that for an early peak and the potential impact of that uh, on the winter time. And Doug is, is exactly right that uh, not only, you know, we can start seeing El Nino development at this time of year, but the the, the huge you know, this has really been a huge El Nino development. Uh, it's ramped up very quickly for this time of year and extremely strongly for this time of year. We have a very strong El Nino right now. Um, so it's, it's in and of itself, that's enough. But for that to develop a very strong El Nino in the late spring is even more impressive. Uh, did that help uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. And thanks, uh, Doug and Dennis. Uh, we just got a note from Mary Knapp out in Kansas, and she says um, additional problems uh, may occur from wet soils, and that would include difficulty in weed pesticide applications and late haying. Uh, some are still waiting for their first alfalfa cutting, and normally they'd be on their second cutting by now. So just something to add to the impacts. Well, this Thank is you. Nancy out in Omaha. Can you hear me? 
Yes, Nancy, go ahead, please. Yeah, so um, earlier today in the um, formerly NCDC conference call, um, the global map showed that the central U.S. is cooler than average in May in contrast to the May being warmest on record globally. And then the forecast, so I'm tying two things together here. So then the forecast going forward is that we continue to be below average in temperatures, in pretty much, or somewhat in Nebraska anyway, which is what I'm asking about primarily, while the expectation is that we'll have the warmest year on record. All right. Can you talk a little bit about what it is that makes us different, what, what weather patterns are at play that are making us the, the um, I guess, the exception to the rule? That's probably the language that I would use. I don't know what language you guys would use. <laughs> Well, that sounds like great language. Uh, this is John Ice. Um, I think that's something that's being studied, too. Um, and that's the thing about we have to remember about the, the whole sense of the climate change and with the warming is that, you know, it's not everywhere necessarily. And uh, there has been, and, and the rest of the panel here can correct me if I'm going off the rails here, but, uh, yeah, there has been talk about that cool donut hole, as it were, <laughs> over the Midwest in the plains and, uh, um, you know, exactly how is that coming about and so forth. But uh, with the rest of the panel, any of you have any you'd like to chime in on? Well, I, I'll briefly kind of mention, I, you know, 2013 and 2014, we had two consecutive years that were below normal. And when you look at the overarching pattern during those two years, it was an incredibly persistent, persistent jet stream that essentially we had this northwest flow pattern that was literally not the entire two-year period, but for many months during that period, we were getting air masses coming out of Canada and consistently falling right into the middle part of the country. And Nancy's absolutely right. When you look at the 2014 map of the globe, essentially the only land mass that was running below normal for that year was right in the middle part of the United States. Every other land mass in the globe was running above normal. So, you know, it, it, it was that jet stream, I think, in my opinion, and other, others can comment, is that northwest low pattern that really occurred for almost new, two years that led to these below normal years back to back. Nancy, I, I think um, uh, probably the perspective to take on all of this, this is Doug again from NOAA, is to, uh, the perspective to take is uh, our time will come. It's just not in the last three years, and climate change doesn't happen over a period of a year or two or three or four or five. It happens over, um, it over, it happens over decades. So uh, uh, that's why we don't, that's why sometimes we don't prefer the, the term global, um, global warming because it, uh, the insinuation is that every place is warming up at the same, um, at the same time, at the, uh, at the same degree. It's not the case. Never will be. We'll still have winter. We'll still have summer. We'll still have variations in climate. We're just going to start um, uh, experiencing um, less extremes on the cold side and more extremes on the warm side over a period of and, time. And I guess we Nancy, had our, our... Go ahead. Nancy, this, this is Dennis. I think if you're referring to, Mar to May specifically, when yes. you look at that map, overlay precipitation and the temperature and you'll see something that, that they're going to be on top of each other. That area that was cool in, in, in May was very much the area that was very wet in May. And in the plains and throughout up, much of the upper Midwest, those two go together in the, in the summertime. If you're wet, you're cool, and if you're dry, you're warm. And, and, and I was wondering, this goes back to that El Nino conversation. Um, I mean, I understand that El Nino is, intensifying the already warm trend globally. And I guess I'm wondering if El Nino, which is delivering us possibly, I heard some hesitation in ascribing it to El Nino in an earlier answer, but if El Nino is delivering us this wetter May, in other words, is, is there kind of a situation where El Nino is making, adding to the heat globally, but it might be adding and contributing to our coolness regionally? Is that, does that make sense as a question? Yes. And the answer to that is, is yes, um, oftentimes, especially with a stronger El Nino. And so El Nino affects huge, huge portions of the ocean um, to a great degree. And that, that water is a heck of a lot warmer than it normally would be, uh, than average, I should say. So um, 
the fact that this is a at least moderate El Nino and potentially a strong one. Um, the downstream effects, the southern part of the U.S., for example, this this winter season and fall um, should be wetter and cooler than normal. The northern part, the northern tier, as uh, Pat showed there from the CPC uh, outlooks, should be warmer than normal. Those are two Thank of the you. classic effects of El Nino. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, you're most welcome, Nancy. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we still have a few minutes if you have any other questions uh, for all of us. Very good. Well, uh, hearing none, um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the monthly Central U.S. Climate Outlook. Uh, we would like to extend an invitation to you to join us on our next webinar, and that will be on July 16th at 1 p.m. Central. Until then, for myself and all the panelists here today, and, and particularly Pat, thank you for your briefing. Have a good day.